morning, everyone, for all of you who are joining us. Appreciate you joining us on a Saturday morning and welcome to this session. Very proudly organized together with Sing Health. Thank you to the speakers also for coming this morning. And I'd like to welcome you all to SG Innovate virtually. And for those who don't know SG Innovate, we are focused on deep tech and we try to drive innovation working with entrepreneurial scientists to build deep tech companies from Singapore for the world. Why deep tech? Because we feel that deep tech has a very big role to play in addressing some of the world's pressing problems that are faced today. And in this morning session, very aptly partnered with Sing Health because we have this common passion of wanting to share knowledge with the community, community of clinicians in the healthcare sector and with the startups to see how together we can use technology to drive innovation in the healthcare space and to bring great solutions that really could help people and humanity at large. I really want to thank Sing Health um, for this partnership and I don't want to be taking too much of the time. I want to thank the speakers and for all of you, I'm really looking forward to this discussion and for a lot more events and partnerships together with Sing Health team to see how we can be bringing the ecosystem together to share the knowledge and to inspire each other to see how we can leverage technology the best of our ability to really also take innovations from lab to market. So before we bring on the speakers, I would like to ask Professor Daniel Thing to please say a few words. Thank you, enjoy. Thanks, Aki, for the kind introduction. Thank you, as you know, for um, the kind of it, uh, invitation for the Singhal folks to speak here. And we also have another very world-renowned Professor Dean Ho coming from NUS. So, I mean, we, today we have actually three speakers uh, to speak. So, firstly, we're going to start with Professor Dean Ho talking about uh, AI in precision medicine, what is the cool things, where, where, where is the future directions, and followed by Dr. Liu Yong is going to share with us some of the very cool machine learning and the deep learning methodologies uh, happening in the literature. And then lastly, we're going to end up with Mr. Benedict Tan, who is going to share us with the challenges and some of the, the pearls to actually integrate the AI into the healthcare system in the real world setting. I'm also very pleased to share with everyone that uh, this year, uh, SingHealth is launching an AI program and uh, feel free to reach out to me, myself, call me Dan, no need, Professor what? let's uh, do it in a tech way. And I'm available in the LinkedIn and reach out. And uh, yeah, I'm... Um, I let's uh, let's uh, kick start with this uh, without further ado. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to speak. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, thank you everybody for having me here today. It's such a pleasure to be um, at SG Innovate among a wonderful uh, group of colleagues here to talk about some of the work we're doing to look at AI and other strategies to optimize how we develop drugs. Uh, for various indications, ranging from oncology to COVID. Um, I'm, uh, I'm coming to everybody from uh, the N1 Institute for Health, also known as N1, Institute for Digital Medicine, also known as Wisdom, as well as the Department of Biomedical Engineering at NUS. And so to, to kick things off, um, the outline uh, of the talk here today will look at challenges with drug development, and then we'll look at a couple of use cases as an example, ranging from how we addressed SARS-CoV-2 all the way to various indications in oncology. Now to illustrate the challenges of developing a drug, the costs are enormous. Various figures are out there, but some of them certainly include the billion dollar range, 2.6 billion from this recent uh, reference here. And the question then is why? Well, we certainly know that it takes a long time to develop drugs. And we also know that the success rates are low. And in the context of combination therapy, one of the major challenges is to figure out which drugs should be selected and at which respective dose for each drug. The notion is that if the drugs that are selected are pretty good for a combination, that even if the dosage is wrong, there will be some threshold efficacy. At the same time, the reality is if the good drugs are picked, but at the wrong dose, there may be no efficacy at all. 
right? So even just picking the right dose can be the difference between efficacy and no efficacy. And at the same time, if we know how to find the right drug doses, the drugs that we should be using in the first place may be completely unexpected, right? So it's absolutely vital that we move beyond the approach of picking some drugs we think will be good and then finding the dose. Instead, we need to resolve the right drugs and the right doses at the same time. But the problem with that is that's an enormously large parameter space, right? If you take a pool of 12 drugs and you look at each drug at 10 different doses, that's a trillion possible combinations, right? It's an insurmountable parameter space, right? So the, the, the challenges of developing drugs in an optimal fashion can be enormous, right? So if we think about reimagining drug development, we have to move beyond just the compounds themselves, right? So during this COVID pandemic, a lot of very innovative work has happened to discover different compounds that are out there, right? Novel repurposing screens, et cetera, et cetera. And this has yielded a lot of really exciting potential candidates. However, finding the right drug candidates are represents one of multiple steps that are needed to truly optimize care. And so not long ago, our team published this kind of workflow here about how to move from discovery to development and then ultimately to administration, right? These are very different segments of the drug development roadmap, all right? But they need to be seamlessly integrated to truly optimize care. So if you look at discovery, Right, this is the process of identifying different candidates to move towards clinical trials. These could be new compounds, these could be repurposed compounds. But after the compounds are discovered, there's a lot more work to do. Right, in the context, if, especially if it's repurposing, even if it's not repurposing, putting these drugs into the proper combinations is an essential part of this roadmap. Right, but again, the problem about optimally designing combinations, which I mentioned earlier, is profound. Other areas like matching patients to trials. And then once these drugs are administered in the clinic, what we've shown is just how dynamic patients can be. A dose that works for a patient on one day may not work for a patient the following day, but by readjusting the dose for that same patient, that can be the difference between response, no response, and even reacquired response. All right. So again, it is absolutely vital to think beyond just the compound. Because as I mentioned, even good drugs given at wrong doses can lead to no efficacy. And it's actually a misperception. The patient can in fact respond if we dose them and calibrate them correctly. So the heart of what we do is what we call this curate correlation, right? What we've shown is that if you correlate drugs and doses as their inputs, that can be related to efficacy and safety. So you've got your drug and dose input, efficacy and safety output, that can be related in a quadratic fashion. And that's important because then with a small amount of information, we can calibrate a cell, we can calibrate a preclinical model, we can calibrate a patient to respond optimally to treatment, whether that's in the context of picking which drugs to give them in the first place, but certainly which corresponding doses for each drug result in an optimal outcome. And this has been validated across many indications, ranging from blood cancers to solid cancers, to HIV, to tuberculosis, fatty liver disease, et cetera, from the preclinical all the way through the clinical level. To add more insight into this, our team has this saying, especially in combo therapy, that we are all parabolas, right? And so what you're looking at here, up there is an actual patient, right? That we prospectively addressed to optimize liver transplant immunosuppression. These are 10 patients being addressed combination therapy for HIV to find better doses for these patients, right? Here you have an example where we're able to find low doses that mediated, right? Undetectable viral load. Lowering the dose of a drug that typically causes substantial side effects over the long term. In this particular case, optimizing the dosages we give dynamically to patients to prevent organ rejection, as well as other indications like leukemia. All right, so 
in the spirit of drug combo design, then ultimately how to optimally dose, got a couple examples of how we do what we do, all right? So during this time, COVID-19, uh, certainly we know it's resulted in profound economic and healthcare challenges. I would say about a little over a year ago, we convened a team out of the Institute that included bioengineers, uh, that included clinicians, but also included healthcare economists, global health security and surveillance experts and beyond, and drug development, uh, drug development experts to initiate a project that we call Identify, optimizing infectious disease combo therapy with AI. And at the time, our objective was to see how fast we could take a pool of drugs take an RNA virus, at the time this was, this was pre-COVID, to look at how quickly we can find optimal combos against this virus. And within days, right? And again, this is not an in silico project. This is a prospective experimental optimization study where we're able to find many options, ranked combinations of how to address RNA viruses. Certainly not long after that, Right, we moved into the COVID-19 space by addressing SARS-CoV-2, but we brought in these healthcare economists, right? We're the KPMG, NUS business uh, and beyond. And, and the notion was, this was in advance of the pandemic that when a pandemic does hit someday, the economic, economical and rapid development of optimized interventions will be essential because of the strain that we know that healthcare systems and industry will have. Right? So we have to do more with less. And so with that, we harnessed Identify to address the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so what we did with this, this is a step-by-step -step thing here. So working with a group of clinicians from around the world, we picked a number of drugs that were in clinical trials at the time. This is around April of last year. And what we did was we strategically developed a set of experiments Right, And then what we did was we effectively are using this small set of experiments to crowdsource the live virus, then to tell us what the optimal combinations are right, to address, uh, address the, the virus and its inhibition. All right, And this is a different approach than standard drug development where you take one or two candidates, you think they might work, and then you see if they work. In this case, we're interrogating a large parameter space, different permutations of drugs and doses from which we can then rank out best all the way to worst combinations available, all right? After we have these rankings set up, we actually revalidate them experimentally again to ensure the robustness of the initial experiment. And from this at the time, among the many drugs that we tried, we found that remdesivir plus Kaletra represented the best possible combination. But this is interesting, right? Because Kaletra alone did not fare well in trials. Remdesivir fared, depending on how we look at it, you know, positively in some, et cetera. But again, both drugs individually, Kaletra as a combo alone was not great. Remdesivir alone was the best performing monotherapy, but could be better. But by putting them together, it effectively turbocharged both. But then the question was why? So this is also experimental data, actual, actual experiments that were run. And we found that lopinavir and remdesivir really do get along quite well, all right? And then we know that lopinavir and ritonavir, they like each other because that's Kaletra. And so when you put all of these three together, the efficacy goes up a lot, right? And this combination was actually independently evaluated in other strains as well, also showing promising results, all right? And so what we have here is again, a combo in Kaletra that didn't work well on its own, but when co-delivered properly with other drugs, all the drugs support each other through unforeseen drug interactions to optimize treatment, all right? But we're not done because again, we don't just come out with one answer. These experiments yield multiple options, but suffice it to say what we saw, especially with some of our other combos like Kaletra alone mirrored clinical trial outcomes. And so while there is clear value to find combinations that can work really well, there's also value to find combinations that we probably should not consider further, right? Because time is critical during the emergence of an outbreak. We wanna know which combinations give us the best chances possible to help patients. But again, we want to try to avoid combinations that we think will not work, all right? And here's one of the other challenges. 
right? When you have a drug combo or another repurposed monotherapy that does not fare well in a clinical trial, unfortunately, many of these drugs are no longer considered any further because they failed clinical trials when being given in a suboptimal fashion. But as we show, if you take drugs alone for repurposing, the chances aren't gonna be great that they're gonna do well. That's why we have to take another step and optimize how we shepherd and develop these drugs further. To close up on identify, we actually put this all out on a publicly available database so that people can go and check the different permutations that came out of the study that will then produce an efficacy reading as well as safety reading. And you can find this on the N1 website. Again, this is all publicly available based upon that study. Moving beyond infectious disease very quickly, we, we, we do a lot of work in oncology. So working with Tam Boon To, Ed Chow, and a great team at NUS, we now are starting a process of obtaining patient samples. And then very rapidly, within about one week, running a prospective optimization study on the patient sample and producing options for the clinicians to select so that again, we know how to optimally address and put our best foot forward when developing therapeutic strategies for patients. And time is of the essence. And this experimentally driven optimization will be com it's completed within a few days, right? And so with that, we've set up a core and we've already started running through this workflow to ensure that it is clinically implementable so that we obtain a sample, work with the clinicians, pick a set of drugs that are clinically actionable. We run the optimization on the sample and within a week or so, we will have ranked options available to the clinician. Now, this is driven by optimization off of phenotypic outcome. This is not a genomically driven approach, right? Because again, we're resolving the best drugs and the best doses together at the same time. Final slide. I talked about designing combinations. We have to talk about optimizing dosing, right? So in this particular case, we have uh, the data here of an advanced prostate cancer patient. Um, who was undergoing a two-drug clinical trial. One was a novel BET bromo domain inhibitor, and the other one was an FDA-approved standard therapy. The patient was responding to this regimen, uh, but you know, the PSA was going down. The PSA correlated well to the tumor burden, confirmed by imaging, but the toxicity was enormous to the point where the patient had considered quitting the trial. With just a small amount of data, it turned out the clinicians had actually changed the doses before we came onto the trial to manage toxicity. This is essential. In oncology, dose modification is driven by toxicity because drugs are typically given at high dose to begin with, right? There was enough dose changes such that we can solve and address this patient's quadratic profile, which is there. And if you take a bird's eye view of this plot, you have the doses of the different drugs as well as the PSA level, we found that the patient with a 50% reduction in the dose of the inhibitor would actually increase the efficacy. One could imagine that that was a challenge for the clinical team because in oncology, dose modification is not efficacy driven, right? It is toxicity driven. So after looking at the data and consulting with the patient, et cetera, the clinical team, we got all the approvals the dosage was reduced within one week, the lowest PSA level seen on the study. That single data point is added into this. The surface doesn't change very much. The dose was kept low. PSA dropped even more, right? However, over time, we'd have to increase the dose a little bit, decrease a little bit, increase a little bit, decrease a little bit to maintain this optimal response, all right? We all know patients are different from each other but it's important to outline that patients are different from themselves over time. And it is essential that during the process of managing treatment that we continuously adapt and personalize and optimize that care. And we do this using a patient's own data to only manage their own treatment, right? And we ultimately achieved a durable response, right? And at the same time, We've expanded this, right? We have trials occurring here now for other solid cancers. We're initiating trials for blood cancers. As we can see here, ranging from COVID to prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, and beyond, right? This is an agnostic approach. It can be rapidly adapted to many indications. The final thing I will say is that 
enabling this to be clinically implemented is certainly uh, the, based on the convergence of many facets of the healthcare workflow. We have the doctors, we have the nurses, we have the pharmacists, right? And then actually we have started running healthcare economic studies to look at cost savings per patient, whether it's from lower dosing of expensive drugs, all the way to the potential of reducing warding due to complications and beyond, including running behavioral sciences studies with both providers, patients, et cetera, to look at what are some of the pain points, what are some of the barriers that we have to scale adoption and deployment, right? This is truly a team effort in order to make this happen, a community effort. And we wanna make sure that beyond just technology being developed, we're addressing all the points to make sure that we can help as many patients as possible. So with that, I wanted to thank everybody for the invitation. Thank all the amazing researchers, clinical collaborators, and supporters of our work. We are deeply grateful. Thanks for having me here today. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Liu Yong uh, from uh, ASTAR, Institute of uh, High Performance uh, Computing. Uh, today, I'm quite happy here uh, to share some uh, recent development in uh, deep learning for image analysis and also uh, natural language uh, processing, uh, NLP in short. So uh, the primary goal of uh, computer vision is to give uh, human level uh, perception to computers. So sometimes even a superhuman level. So how do we do this? Typically we, we present each image into a matrix. So from that matrix, we use some algorithm such as a deep learning to then the feature uh, representation. So with the feature representation, we can do some tasks for example, classification. So for example, to classify an image into different disease, into normal, abnormal, we can also do the object detection. For example, to, to detect nodules from the CT scan, we can also do the segmentation. For example, to segment certain lesions from the, the tissues, we also can do segmentation on the vessels. Uh, and also we can do the image uh, captioning, basically to give the summary for each image and also a different video. So these are some uh, successful applications, for example, autopilot style transfer. So we can generate um, those, uh, uh, the, the painting with certain uh, artistic effects uh, using uh, something called GAN, uh, generative vessel network. We can also do the face recognition, cell detection, image segmentation on different vessels and also the disease uh, diagnosis. Uh, so this is some uh, brief uh, history of the computer vision. About uh, 50 years back, uh, Prof Minsky assigned this computer vision task as a summer project to his uh, student. Let's uh, do this over the summer. But it turns out um, doesn't work that way. It takes us about 50 years to have some success on this uh, computer vision task. So on, on re until recently, due to the advance in uh, computer vision algorithms, for example, convolutional neural network, uh, also the large amount of uh, uh, data and also the uh, computing resources such as the GPU. So we're able to solve uh, some of the computer vision problems. For example, you may be aware, uh, AlphaGo uh, skin cancer screening, uh, deep face recognition. Uh, but there are still a lot of challenges. For example, we always need a large amount of data and always we, we need large amount of labels. Uh, this labeling part is very uh, time consuming and so it's also very tedious work. So in this case, uh, how do we solve this problem? Uh, someone say the label are the opium for machine learning researchers, it's true. Uh, we are so addicted to that. In order to get 0.95 or 0.96, I always call Daniel to give us uh, more data with better labels. But it doesn't, but the human doesn't learn in that way. It's, it's especially our babies. Uh, they actually, they are able to explore the world by themselves and figure out what's wrong, what's, uh, what's right, and learn by themselves. Uh, for example, the pioneer, 
of deep learning, Yang Le Queen and the Yosh uh, Benjo, uh, also said that self-supervised learning could be the key to human level uh, intelligence because uh, human uh, may also learn in that way. Because, for example, in, in the medical area, the labels are it's quite hard to get. And also, uh, there are so many unloaded data over there. So how do we learn from this, um, using this self-supervised learning? So in this, so this uh, contrastive learning could be one approach for this uh, self-supervised learning. So for example, given this uh, image, a cat, uh, if we do some data augmentation, for example, uh, change the background or rotate the image a little bit, and then we fade them into a new network. In the beginning, this new network will give us a very different feature vector because in the beginning, new network does not know which pixel is a cat, which pixel is the background. So in that case, we can force these two feature factor to be similar. So in, in some sense, the new network will give us the same feature, no matter what kind of color the image is, no matter what kind of degree the image has been rotated. So by doing this, uh, the new network is able to capture the most important feature uh, from this image regarding this cat. So in this case, we do not need human to allocate this image as cat. We just need to rotate the image to a different angle, uh, put different colors, uh, change the shape of the, of the image. So basically, we're able to generate label by computer to train the system. So that's the meaning of the contrastive uh, learning. So there are some uh, applications uh, of this contrastive learning for medical images. For example, these are different scans, 3D scan. So volume one is patient one, volume two is patient two, volume three is another patient. So at the same location, at the same position, uh, the, the scan should look quite similar across different patients. So in this case, we can force this, uh, the features to be similar. But at the different position, uh, the, the features should be different. So in that case, we force the features at different position to be this similar. So this will be the signal for us to train a new network. So in this case, we can use this uh, contrastive learning to train a new network to learn the important features from this scan. We also have uh, uh, some other applications using self-supervised learning. For example, uh, in this case, the first one is to put the colors on the gray school images. So basically we can use the uh, the frames from the video. For example, the first frame and second frame should be uh, should be similar. So in that case, we use the uh, we we use the first the, the color from the first frame as a signal to train the second frame. So in this case, we extract label from the data itself. That's the that's the gist of the soft supervised learning. There are still labels, but the label is not from human. The label is within the data. So this self-supervised learning try to figure out the label from data by itself. So that's the core idea of self-supervised learning. Uh, another example of this, uh, placing the image patch in the right place, for example, like this puzzle. So you may play this game before, it's very good for kids because they can learn different animals by this way. So we we'll use the same approach to train computer, to ask the computer to, play, to place the image patch in the right location. So by, by, by doing this, the computer can figure out how the, this uh, tiger looks like, but without human to annotate this uh, tiger. So that's the core idea. Uh, this is another example. For example, we randomize the sequence of the frame within the same video and ask the computer to organize uh, the frames in a proper manner, in a proper order. So this is another example to train a computer to recognize the human, the ball in this uh, video frame. Yeah. So beyond the application to computer vision, this uh, self-supervised learning also can be used for tabular data. As a, tabular data means the data in the form of Excel file sheet. So typically, neural network does not perform very well for this kind of tabular data. So uh, in this case, we can also use uh, self-supervised learning. So the task here, 
for example, is to predict the income level based on the different uh, uh, parameters. For example, the age, the gender, occupation, educational levels. So in this case, how do we do self supervised learning? Basically, we just take out some information from the table and force the network to recover those missing information. So in this case, the label is from the data itself. We don't need human to give us a label. Basically, we just take out some info from the, from the, the table in the top because some information are correlated. For example, the, the occupation is correlated with the education level. So in this case, by doing this, the system can learn the, those important features. So once we have those features using the soft fast learning, we can put into these uh, uh, labels for this uh, fine tuning. So it can give us a very good performance. It even outperform the best performance, for example, the gradient boosting. So beyond the application to computer vision, tablet data, self-supervised learning also has been widely used for NLP. So for example, um, for NLP, we need to find a way to represent the world. So for computer vision, basically we just use a matrix to represent the pixels at a different location. But for, for world, how do we represent them? So we can learn them. So the first, uh, the first version is something called one heart. It's very simple. Basically, we have a huge uh, dictionary and each word has an index over there. And then the corresponding location will be one. The rest will be zero. So this is a, a very simple way, uh, simplest way to represent the world, but it doesn't work very well. So the second version is called is a TF. Basically, it's some kind of frequency-based approach. Basically, if this wall appear many times in the document, then we'll give a higher frequency. So that's another way, which also costs uh, statistics-based methods. It, it works better, but still not good enough. The recent approach is to use this uh, word to vector and also something called BERT to learn the, the, the embeddings to, to, uh, to represent the wall in a much better way. So for example, each column uh, in read is, is the vector for different words. But how do we learn them? So this uh, word to vector uh, matters basically uh, input these uh, vectors into this matrix and then do another matrix calculation, try to recover another word. So in this case, the idea is, for example, this, this sentence, it is very good. Then we'll take out the is. Then we'll only put the it very good as the inputs, the output is is. So we'll force the network to give us the output as is. This, this is one training sample. Another training sample is we take out the very. So we just put it is good, but the output must be very. So in the beginning, the output is random, but we have the signal because we can just take out a missing word. It's something like a clause, like how our kids learn English. So they're also supposed to put in the missing word uh, in, into the passage. So but by doing this, we don't need human to give us label. We can use whatever textbook, Wikipedia, whatever information over the internet to train this neural network. So it's a very efficient because we don't need human to give us any label in this case. So that's also how human learn, learn language. We always uh, ask our kids to read books such that they can improve the language, you can improve the English. That's the same approach that we use to train our neural network. So by doing this, these vectors become meaningful. For example, if we take out a vector of France minus the vector of Paris, it will roughly equal to the vector of Italy minus the uh, vector of Rome. So in this case, each embedding have a certain uh, semantic meaning. So from that uh, meaning, we can use the, the embedding to do a lot of tasks. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, this is the a recent development for this uh, 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 language embedding, which is called BERT. So for example, the idea also similar, we take a sentence and then we do some random mask. For example, we mask, I want to go shopping, but the goal, we, took, we make a mask. Then we force the network to output the goal at the corresponding location. So by doing this, 
we actually train this the transformer encoder to learn a better way to represent each word, such that, uh, such that when there's a, another word take off, for example, want, then the network also can give us the correct word at the corresponding location. So we can also use a lot of uh, sentences uh, freely available from internet, from any books or textbooks, or even medical documents to train a network in this way. So in this case, we do not need human to give us any label. So that's also another application of uh, self-supervised learning. So once we have these embeddings, uh, how can we use them? For example, what we can do is the FAQ retrieval. So when user asks a question, how do we find the corresponding answer? So in this case, each question will be tokenized into different tokens. And then we got the binding, the, the vectors we learned just now, for, for example, from the bird. Then, then after that, we use that vector to compare with the question in our database to find the closest match. Then we return the answer to the user. So this also how the chatbot is designed to, uh, uh, to, to, to basically uh, give the answer back to the end user. The other task is this open and uh, reading comprehension. For example, giving this a passage, then we'll ask some questions. What causes uh, this uh, precipitation to fall? So the answer is uh, gravity. So it's something uh, our kids are doing for their PSLE uh, English reading comprehension. So by in this case, it's an open and which means it's not MCQ. It's just give a sentence, give a paragraph, then the teacher will ask a question and whether the computer can figure out answer by itself. So basically this is how it works. So we use the bird. So the question will be here. The paragraph will be here. So we then we uh, try to, the network will give us two locations, one star and the one is end, which means where the answer start and where the answer end. So by doing this, we can train the network to give us the answer from the passage. So NLP can also be applied in healthcare in many ways. For example, we can do the automatic, uh, automatic report generation, uh, electronic health record analysis, uh, medical chatbot, and also the uh, different cross domain bot to answer uh, those uh, very domain specific uh, medical questions. This is another example. So given X3, uh, these images, the system is able to generate these medical reports like a human uh, radiologist. So uh, actually computer vision uh, also can use transfer, but a transformer kind of structure. So in this case, uh, we basically can uh, put this image into different patches and fit into this uh, transformer encoder. And then this transformer encoder can also uh, do tell us uh, what class uh, this image is. So in this case, the difference here is we do not use any convolutional neural network. So in last few years, convolutional neural networks is very successful, but still have a lot of challenges. So people are trying to use the same approach uh, from NLP to solve the problems in computer vision. So this is a very good uh, example and also recent development. How can we do away with saying N? So this is, could be the answer uh, for that question. The next part, I want to cover something about uh, fiduciary learning, which helped to address uh, a very important uh, challenge in healthcare AI. For example, when the data are located at different hospitals or even different uh, countries, how can we uh, learn a model together? Because sometimes we are not able to move the data across the country due to uh, IRB uh, constraint, due to certain policy, security policy. So in this case, uh, we have something called a uh, federal learning uh, to learn a model together, even the data are physically located in different places. So in this case, uh, the network have uh, this cloud server, which will send uh, the, the, the initial ways to different uh, model at different places. And after that, uh, each model will do a local update. And then the error will be sent back to the server 
The server will average them together and send back results to different model at a different location. Yeah. Okay. So there are two ways. One is horizontal learning. For example, the data have the same label, have same features. The other way is the data have a different features at different place. So basically, uh, so there are two ways to do this. One is the centralized server. Everyone can update to the server at the one place. The other one is the uh, distributed communication, which means there's no central server. So they will uh, share the ways among themselves. So basically that's, um, that's all from my part, thank you. Hey, hi, uh, very good uh, Saturday morning to all of you. Uh, I'm Benedict and I'm with uh, Sing Health and I'm the Group Chief Digital Strategy Officer. Uh, gives me great, great pleasure to be here sharing with you the application of AI in the healthcare domain. Uh, I would like to correct myself, it should be health and healthcare domain. Uh, the reason why I mentioned health and emphasize on health is that um, you know, uh, for too long, a lot of us have been uh, focusing too much on healthcare. Right? Personally, and I think that's where the government and many of the countries are going towards, is to stress the importance of keeping yourself healthy, right? So as not to cross the bridge into healthcare, because many a times, the minute we cross the bridge into healthcare, uh, it's probably a one-way ticket. Uh, for example, if you're diabetic, uh, it's very, very difficult for you to be non-diabetic. That's in the area of chronic disease. So without further ado, uh, let me proceed to my next slide. Um, not working. Sorry. So um, as my two uh, distinct uh, presenters have shared earlier uh, on the application of uh, AI in the respective domains, um, I would like to give a very broad sharing of where are the other areas where AI can add value to health and healthcare. So first off, uh, we need to support better health, better care outcome, uh, better patient experience, and access to healthcare facilities, right? And we want to improve the productivity and efficiency of care delivery. We need to take note that the disease, the illness that we are facing nowadays are getting more and more complex. Of course, uh, right now we are actually facing the COVID-19 pandemic situation. So how can we uh, come together to combat and manage uh, these diseases? I think AI is a way, uh, is one of the answer, right? And uh, as my first speaker, uh, first presenter, Dean has actually shared how we actually apply AI uh, to, to better manage, to better identify um, the disease so that to better apply the uh, drug for better, much better efficacy. Uh, we also want to we apply AI, right, to kind of uh, increase that area as well. And Liu Yong has also special, also kind of uh, 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 shared, right, that the, his, the technology that's available for us to read images, to diagnose images, right, all these can all be applied in the area of health, healthcare. But I actually want to share that uh, one of the important things, the outcome that we want to reach is actually towards uh, personalized medicine, right? So right now, medicine is actually practiced pretty much in a very broad area uh, with the advancement in AI, we hope to be able to treat the patients as an individual because all of us have a different construct and so on and so forth. And uh, as we move into that area, uh, personalized medicine and with information, with decision being democratized, right? We would hopefully go towards what we call self patient self-care or maybe uh, an interim step is co-managed care with the doctors or healthcare providers because AI is available. I'm hoping one day, right? Everybody just key in your parameters, temperature, uh, and so on and so forth, conditions in your mobile phone and AI, 
an AI engine in the background will flash up and tell you what's your condition, right? So actually there are three areas uh, that AI can, that the healthcare can gain from AI, right? So um, the circle is actually <coughs> what we call the uh, supply chain or healthcare chain. Self-care, triage, diagnostics, clinical decision support, care delivery, chronic care management. This is actually a very broad categorization of where AI can be applied, right? So, and on the side, we have actually listed down all the various uh, initiatives, various solutions that have been applied in this particular area, right? So, uh, at the bottom, right, what we have is actually a process improvement, improving pop health, improving operations as well as strengthening innovation, right? So these are many, many areas where AI can be applied in health. So just a very quick example of uh, AI in Singapore. Uh, I think recently China News Asia has uh, done an interview uh, about Singapore, the Selena, Singapore Eye Lesion Analyzer Plus, right? So it is actually uh, helping uh, our doctors, our eye doctor, diagnose based on an image, whether the patient uh, has got uh, retinopathy or not, right? So uh, this is very, very interesting person in the world. And um, what it does is that it takes the critique uh, of uh, people who read uh, uh, images. And the good thing is it's uh, 24 by seven, uh, no need to take sick leave, no need to take maternity leave and so on and so forth. Uh, don't even need to take tea break or coffee break. Yeah, so it's there. So hopefully one day, again, like I said, as uh, we progress, as AI progress, everything can be democratized and be packaged into your mobile phone and, it's, and you can do literally almost self-care. So these are the AI, <coughs> more AI uh, use cases around the world. And Pingan, they have a good doctor. Uh, they have a kiosk where you can go in, right? Answer some questions and they can uh, give you a diagnosis. Uh, I was even told that they can also give you a prescription on the spot. Did my health uh, predicting acute kidney injury? Uh, yeah, Babylon, this is, uh, this is one of the most advanced and interesting AI um, program uh, up in the UK, right? So again, you can key in your parameters, it's actually a chatbot, and they can actually arrive uh, at uh, diagnosis and advice for you. And the last one is Cuventus, right? So it's improving healthcare operations. So go on to the next slide. While we understand that uh, there's huge uh, opportunities to apply AI in the area of health healthcare, right? There are also challenges to AI adoption, right? So the first thing that uh, a lot of us uh, challenge is actually the quality and sustainability of current solutions in the market. Um, as my as uh, Dean and Leong has actually mentioned earlier, uh, they rely a lot on data. Yeah. So the uh, question is whether the data that was used to develop a certain AI solution, say in a Nordic country or in America or in Europe, whether it can be applied uh, here, over here in, in the Asian context. We all know that we have uh, different DNA, different body mix, different BMIs, etc. So we need to come back. We need to bring the, the AI solution back and retest it right, before we can even use it right, to test its uh, valid, uh, veracity and, and its application. Next thing is about the digital literacy of healthcare practitioners. Um, personally, I don't think this is a challenge locally, right? I've worked many, many years, more than 30 years in uh, healthcare IT, and I'm proud to kind of uh, share that a lot of our doctors and nurses are very, very enthusiastic in the use of AI and application of AI. Next one is data quality issues. Okay, so this is the main, one of the biggest challenges, right? And data governance, right? So with PDPA, uh, Personal Data Protection Act, uh, we have to 
kind of uh, comply with it. Otherwise, um, the latest uh, act, revision of the act is that you can be fined up to 10% of your total revenue. So if you make a million dollar, you can, if you don't comply, uh, that goes 10% of your revenue, right? Uh, security as well as interoperability, right? So we all know again, right, that uh, garbage in, garbage out, and this is very, very true for AI. So the data quality issue is something we need to kind of uh, make sure that it is of a certain quality, quality a certain grade to be used to develop the AI engine. Uh, large scale change management, uh, people are afraid that they would soon be replaced by a machine. They would soon be out of job. Yeah. Um, again, uh, may not be a huge challenge in, in, in Singapore, um, but Nevertheless, a challenge. Yeah? Uh, the reason why I, I mentioned it's not that a huge challenge because we are increasingly facing an issue of uh, uh, reducing population and uh, as well as silver tsunami. More and more of us will be uh, aged, right? And less and less uh, of the fit young uh, population that's doing much of the work. So hence, in order to increase productivity, in order to continue to maintain the healthcare standard, uh, we would have to deploy more and more AI solution. Next off is lack of well-defined AI regulatory framework. Uh, again, uh, in Singapore, uh, thanks to our very, very, very capable government, uh, this is an area where we are actually actively looking into and uh, publishing a lot of uh, uh, policies and guidelines. Uh, Next area, lack of AI resources in Singapore, I said to say this is actually very, very true, right? So um, we need to train more, working with the various uh, Institute of Higher Learnings to train more AI uh, uh, resources out so that uh, it can help to contribute to our AI endeavor. And the last one is fund, funding and cost uh, slash benefit analysis. So uh, operating and uh, supporting a public health care environment uh, costs is always uh, 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 a challenge in managing. Uh, so, but we all do know that uh, with advanced technology, sometimes it costs a little bit more. So how we overcome these challenges, um, we need to address ethical, legal, and societal impact of AI, right? Uh, that's part of what we call change management. Uh, we need to evaluate AI technologies using standards and benchmarks, uh, regulatory framework. Uh, we need to publish that uh, and have everybody apply to that. And uh, in the area of healthcare, right? Um, the Health Science Authority, right? Has, has got a policy that uh, before we implement an AI um, enabled solution, uh, we would have to seek uh, approval from HSA. We need to partner Right, so very glad that uh, SingHealth is partnering SG Innovate and many and many other uh, uh, <clears throat> renowned institutions and agencies to develop and, uh, and progress more in the area of AI. Um, and last but not least is actually on funding. So how can we have more funding uh, to develop in the, uh, in the area of AI? So these are just some quotes uh, on what is the future of healthcare. Again, I want to sum up by saying that uh, we are, uh, personally, we hope to progress towards the area of personalized medicine. Yeah, uh, how that would be the, to me, will be the uh, uh, utopia or, or the peak of medicine. And as, as we have more and more AI solutions and engines available, uh, I'm also quite optimistic that uh, the, the days of uh, the era of self-managed care uh, will not be too far away. Uh, with that, I thank you. I'm going to hand over back to the organizer. Well, we will now be uh, proceeding to the panel discussion. Can I please invite the speakers to take their seats?
Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, guys, uh, again, uh, for the super exciting talk. That's why it explains why we overrun. So just to give the audience uh, some, uh, you know, the opportunity to, uh, to hear more. So we decided to extend for another 15 minutes to uh, 11.30. So I think this is one of the, the, the better way to spend your Saturday morning to listen to all these uh, world-renowned, you know, AI experts in the field. And uh, I also have a co-moderator here, Professor Henry Ho. He's uh, the director for the Innovation Center for the Singh Health and also the director for Medical Technology Office with a huge experience in the medical technology space. So I had a really privilege to have all my bros here today. And uh, let's kick start with some uh, the questions from the audience. So we have already three coming in. And uh, I was just, actually, I was just sitting there and think, why would, why was I so uneasy just now on the stage when I started introducing everyone? I just recall that for the last one and a half years, I haven't had a chance to stand on the podium to speak. And it's always, always like through the Zoom. And that actually was explaining how uneasy I was when I first started introducing the speakers. So, okay, let me, uh, you know, redeem myself here in the panel discussion. So um, let's, uh, let, let's start with the first question. So Dean, you're on the, you're on the spot. So I, I, I saw the audience was asking about some Reinforcement learning. So about alpha four, alpha four one and two. We know the first caps thirteen alpha four has actually you know won the competition. Alpha four two, the performance has actually increased by fifteen to twenty percent based on you know as compared to the one that actually uh, published and it was in fact reported in Nature News and Comments. So I mean the questions from the audience is: Has anyone used reinforcement learning approach? to allow machines to conduct self-supervised learning of images, much like DeepMind has used it um, for their games. And of course, the reinforcement team has actually also used it in Alpha 4. Dean, would you want to actually uh, have some comments on that? Sure, I think to, to start commenting on Alpha Fold first, I think that was quite exciting because if you look at the number of protein structures that have been resolved and the number of proteins that actually exist in the world, there's a lot of there's a lot of work that has to be done. Right. We know just how difficult it is using traditional approaches to uh, resolve protein structures. There needs to be ways to do this accurately and rapidly because if we look at the implications, it's a lot more than just figuring out the structure of a protein. For those who are not familiar with the field, it's about looking at better ways to address protein misfolding disorders. Right. Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, yeah. which are enormously challenging to address. And certainly, once we're, we're, we're more able to rapidly look at protein structure and how these proteins interact with surrounding structures like membranes, et cetera, our ability for drug discovery will be completely redefined. Yeah. Right. And so I, I think you're, you're looking at everything from diagnosis to treatment to accelerated discovery and beyond. And what was truly remarkable is, you know, AlphaFold 1 wasn't the only part of the story, right? AlphaFold 2 was already underway and, yeah. and, 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 and open field from here on out. And so if you look at the, the, the benefits of this strategy and how it can be further applied to areas like imaging, which your teams are, are doing remarkable work in, I also think the sky's the limit there. Mm. Um, you know, the, the unpredictability of protein folding confronted with traditional strategies is an insurmountable challenge. Yeah. And with AlphaFold, we now have evidence that it is not only addressable, it's rapidly addressable. Yeah. You're talking about a few days of learning plus a few more days of, of you know, of, of deriving the, the answers that are unprecedented. It's broad applicability to areas of which we have this team here that has clear clinical expertise in is, is, is gonna be very exciting. Yeah, so just, uh, I, I can't agree more. And in fact, when the, uh, the first paper, Alpha uh, Go and Alpha Go Zero came out, right? I mean, so the first paper came out in 2015 and then followed by very quickly, one and a half years later, Alpha Go Zero came out and then they beat the same machine within 40 days and then they out, just go back to Ben's, uh, you know, the talk. No leave needed to take, no one's going to take sick leave, no need tea break. They're actually self playing for 40 days and they actually, uh, you know, beaten the previous machine, you know, by a lot of uh, percentages. So, I mean, this is one of the breakthroughs that I always like to use in my 
scientific presentations that I use, you know, to actually really inspire the younger ones to really take up. So I just wanted to ask the same questions to Liu Yong as well on the reinforcement learning. I know personally Liu Yong really well. He did his PhD in re reinforcement learning. And Liu Yong, can you tell us how this re uh, deep reinforcement learning could be applied to the imaging, which is the audience is using, and tie in with the self-supervised learning that you have just, uh, you know, shared with the audience? Okay, actually for the um, AlphaGo, they actually also use the image analysis techniques plus the reinforcement learning. Yeah. That's why they call it deep reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, we have something called state, we have something called action, yeah. and something called reward. When we apply different action on different state, we got different reward. But like a case will touch the fire got burned, so next time they will not touch the fire again. So in this case, the whole chess board is an uh, image for yeah. computer. Yeah. So when computer apply different actions, different moves, the state may change. So the reward also change. So by doing this, uh, basically the, the first step is to analyze the image. So, so we could potentially apply the same way a uh, medical image. For example, we have a different treatment uh, of, um, uh, for the same patient. If the image change over the time, and then we can use that as the reward to uh, guide the training of the whole process. Right. So that could be one application. Yeah. Thanks, Liu. And uh, yeah, so we have uh, we, we move on to um, uh, you know the question two, and then I would uh, probably put Henry and Ben on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> no, listening to the two of you, uh, it's really Nirvana state kind of a description. I just want to put it back to Ben and say that you no, know, as clinicians, I wanted to. Yeah. Know, how, how would I be able to reach the state? And, and what, as the chief digital officer of Hodge Youth Care System, how can we actually be partnering you to strategize in such a way that we can be walking this journey towards the Nirvana state that is possible, clearly, you know, uh, for something to describe already. So what are your priorities and the blueprint that you have in mind for the clinician that we can actually be joining you for this journey towards there? Yeah. Oh, well, that's a very, very interesting and I think almost philosophical question. Yeah. So, so um, I think to start off with uh, the important ingredient uh, that I would kind of uh, wish everybody adopt uh, is is partnering, partnership, right, and teamwork. Uh, and and to do that, of course, the underlying uh, thing is about trust. Yeah. So, but more on uh, uh, teamwork and, and partnership, and 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 to that, I got to you know uh, thank uh, Daniel uh, at all uh, for coming together for baby uh, for being able to put this team together, and and I kind of hope that you know the the Sing Health AI Health program um, will be the start, right, to yeah. bring more and more people together on the same table, saying same spot and see how we can all work collaboratively towards the same goal yeah uh, as you can see just this small uh, you know party of five right a diverse <laughs> uh, talent uh, that has huge huge possibility and and and, and potential to come together to work towards uh, 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 achieving a greater goal uh, and the other thing I mentioned was about change management, right? So um, I'm actually hoping that, you know, even partnering SG Innovate, we have much more of such uh, events yeah. to spread the word, to, to share the knowledge, uh, to share the potential, and, and to reach out to, to everybody else to come together to, to, to work. You know, I'm kind of like trying to do some kind of, a, you know, a, rarely speech yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i suppose it's a good call yeah uh, and and i hope hope i've answered your question but i think uh, there's much more work to be done but i think the first step uh, to quote uh, henry ford um, you know to come together is the beginning mm -hmm. and then uh, working together with your success thank you yeah yeah so i mean dean i mean you know just uh, uh tapping on what ben has uh, just said you know how we could bring um you know, the Institute of Higher Learning, he also mentioned quite a few times in the Ben's talk and uh, being the chair for the, uh, the director, you know, um, of the Institute of Medicine Wisdom that you set up, 
how do you think you know both say Sync Health and NUS could kind of also achieve such collaborations to bring you know not just the boys. Sorry about uh, you know having a. <laughs> I promise to have a, a list of the uh, females uh, panelists next time. And how how can we bring the whole ecosystem in Singapore together and to really position ourselves as one of the global AI innovation hubs? You know, and attract a lot of MNCs to come invest in Singapore. Yeah. That's a great question. I think that in order to, it's paradoxical, right? So in order to really deploy technology to a point where it's a part of life, uh, everyday routine, yeah. I think it's important to note that technology alone cannot change healthcare, yeah. right? And, and what's really exciting about this ecosystem, when I say this ecosystem, I'm talking about Sing Health, yeah. NUS, Wisdom, N1, Biomedical Engineering, and beyond yeah. is that there are so many steps needed after a great technology is conceived to then certainly validate it. And then uh, how we define collaboration, right? I'll give you an example. So, you know, NUS Biomedical Engineering is about to move into a new building. And this building is certainly in the, resides within the engineering faculty. But if we look at where it's physically located, just over the hill is business. Right, and so many other disciplines, communications, new media. After you have a technology, you have to validate. Certainly engineers must interact with clinicians. Even that piece of it is an extraordinary journey. Yeah. It needs to be trust built. There needs to be a collaborative way of designing studies to truly determine if that technology is effective. And then there has to be questions asked to the, to the doctors, to the nurses, to the pharmacists, of is this making your life easier or harder? Yeah. The technology alone can be amazing, but is it making your life easier? Is it resulting in better outcomes for patients, obviously? But after that's done, there are questions of how does this technology pay for itself, right? There's a healthcare economics component. Uh, there's a, a logistics component. There's a behavioral sciences component to ensure that there's incentives there for this to be continuously used. Right, and then all the way beyond, and all the way towards the end, there needs to be potentially things like a reimbursement discussion or insurability discussions. Wisdom's very first hire, you know, Johan Sapinel is from the insurance sector, right? And we did this because we wanted to have early recognition of the barriers we would need to overcome and the questions we would have to ask for all of our technologies to have a chance, right? Now, the final thing I'll say is. I think it's important not to over technify healthcare, right? We don't want to have patients with five wearables on each arm, <laughs> et cetera. Like the model superhero. And the thing is, we have to ask questions beyond what is the unmet need, yeah. right? Because there's so many things out there that are amazing that address unmet needs, but are not implementable, yeah. right? We have to leverage what's unique and amazing about this ecosystem and pair that with addressing the unmet needs and all of these stakeholders have to come into play. Again, it's some of these very interesting learning experiences where we step outside of what we know that leads to the most important impact. When we did that COVID study, yeah. that whole study was done in two weeks, right. very quick. But then we spent months asking questions about supply chain, mm -hmm. right? Which then now led us to redesign the whole study to include therapies that are actually deployable and accessible, yeah. right? So you spend a few weeks implementing tech, you spend months thinking about other, even not tech related questions to really find out how useful something is. Yeah. But again, this is an amazing ecosystem here. The accessibility of all the stakeholders, I think is unparalleled. Time matters, knowledge matters, the accessibility and bringing all of that together matters. And I think that's gonna to lead to phenomenal outcomes. All right, just to add to that point, um, if you were to do it all over again, how would you do it differently? And what would you do differently? Accelerate the entire process and make it a little bit better. If I were to rethink the whole process, you know, I, I think starting at the end, as much as you can uh, early on, and, and, and that's an interesting thing because it, it, and it's hard, right? Because if you're developing a technology, you're going to want to focus on, on validating the technology. Yeah. We have a drug combination optimization approach. You want to prove that it works. 
if you want to have a dosing optimization platform, you want to prove that it works. But there are questions that will inevitably come up down the road yeah. uh, in terms of how much is it, simple question, how much will it cost? How much will it cost or increase the cost per patient, right? Uh, is this going to be accessible only to healthcare systems that are fully loaded on resources? Mm. What about resource limited settings, mm. right? What kind of biases may exist in this approach that may limit its ability to be useful for as many people as possible? Yeah. And then ultimately, there's another question of if you're going to deploy this across the globe or even in a region, what are some of the region specific questions and even all the way down to fears mm. and misperceptions that environment we have about the technology uh, that will limit the ability to even recruit patients. Yeah. So starting and asking as many questions as possible from you start with A, you end up at Z. Start asking some of those questions that are down towards that end of the spectrum will better inform how to implement that technology. Yeah, actually, in the same vein, I'll ask the same question to Ben, because coming from a healthcare perspective where safety is paramount and you're looking at validation from that perspective, if someone is to introduce an AI and introduce to you, how would you like to assess or validate the safety before you say, hey, this is something that's suitable to be used in a clinical setting, for example? Right. Um, I, I, I think as with all technology, we will need to test, test and test. But the challenge here with AI would be uh, the availability of, avail availability of good and relevant right. data, yeah. right? So, so um, I mean, there are many algorithms that's been developed all over the world, right? Question is, how can we take those algorithms, understand the data needs, and then to verify whether we have, first of all, we collected those data, yeah. and, uh, and even we have collected those data, whether the, you know, the integrity of the data, the accuracy of the data, um, needs to be determined before we, we feed that into the engine to verify. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate challenge that we will have, right? Uh, and if that we don't have the relevant data, then it's a whole new different sets of challenges mm -hmm. altogether. Yeah. So uh, again, test, test, test. Uh, and, and as with many other, uh, and, and I think it's the same as for, for all the other medical uh, practices, right? Uh, when you want to use the data, when you use a solution, right, then you would have to provide the testing data to a company, uh, the whatever authority in this case is probably, uh, it's like the HSA, uh, mm. who will then do further testing and validation before they allow you to use AI solution. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I just wanted to uh, tap on that point to actually further ask Ben as well. Then I'm going to ask uh, during a technical question. So Ben, I mean, I, I'm sure there's a lot of tech company in the ecosystem will come to you and say, hey, I have this AI algorithm. Can you actually help us to get these adopted in Singha, for instance? Yeah. How are you uh, currently, uh, what's your approach in terms of convincing the clinicians on the ground uh, and linking them up with such technology? And what would be, you know, some of the approaches that your office has taken? so far okay it's, i mean daniel is a very interesting question uh, now that you have asked that question uh, never really thought about it but uh i think it's the other way around that that you know you have to you, you turn the table here yeah yeah uh these tech companies are going to clinicians and uh, and uh, you know diagnostic departments and what have you right. and they're engaging and they're engaging the users they're engaging okay. the business get them excited then Together they come to me. I see. How can we get those things? Okay. And I think that is the correct way to do it. Right. Yeah. Because first of all, you I think you they have to engage the professionals like yourself, like Henry. Sure. Yeah. Sorry, like yourself, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Confused. <laughs> uh, bring the clinicians yeah. on board and then and then take the next step so that we can support from the digital uh, 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 angle we can support by providing the right data, the, the right resources, the right facilities yeah. to get the AI thing uh, yeah. validated and implemented. Right, right. That's Thanks right. to Dean's point that you know the clinical need is something that's right. important. Yes. We even talk about the AI behind it. And next, of course, what Ben has mentioned, the relevance of the data, the quality of the data, if there's matching at all before the AI can be entered or be validated in terms of safety. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And hence, uh, uh, I mentioned earlier when I was sharing that uh, in Singapore, we don't have a, a huge challenge in the, in, in the sense of the, the, the professional healthcare professionals not coming on board. Yeah. And I suppose that's, 
that's one way where you know the industry are engaging the, the healthcare pro professionals, get them uh, excited, intoxic, intoxicated with AI. <laughs> uh, yeah, and sure. the change but is is thankfully don't have to be done by me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So I mean going with your test, test, test. So now the technical, the more hardcore technical stuff for Liu Yong, right? So I mean there's a question so how do you prospectively validate the output of the AI models? Do you do continuous AI learning? And uh, the other thing is uh um there's, there's another question that I can uh, see from the question is how do you envision using GAN to actually address some of the data uh, you know, shortage issues in the medical imaging field. Yeah. Can you okay. share with the audience? Yeah. yeah. So for the first uh, question, uh, for example, uh, how do we ensure that the model is robust? Yes. So, uh, for example, one way, of course, is to test yeah. on the prospective data. But in some times, we cannot ensure we have test all the cases. It's in simply impossible. Yeah. Uh, like autonomous car. Yes. There are so many scenarios on the road. Yeah. Even test not cannot test all the scenarios. Mm. So in this case, we need to understand uh, how this uh, deep learning uh, CNN works. Yeah. So to understand when it works and when it doesn't work, so we can understand in what condition we need to uh, we need to put the safety uh, stop over there. So in this case, uh, we need to analyze the inputs. So for example, uh, for, for example, which uh, inputs will trigger <clears throat> the failure of the network mm. uh, such that uh, people are looking into the adversarial attack. So yeah. basically, uh, people can change, like, just put some noise into the input data, the AI model field. Yeah. For example, people change, put some noise into the uh, stop sign, uh, but for Tesla car, it becomes like uh, 80 kilometers per second. So yeah. it's not stop, but actually speed up. It's like how the panda can also be treated like a given. Uh, this is a very famous example. It's like how a visceral attack, you know, the stop sign, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so researchers actually are looking into this to understand under what condition the AI actually failed. Yeah. So for example, uh, there are two uh, scenarios for, to, to make AI fail. One is the intentional attack. Uh, for example, the adversarial uh, example you mentioned just now. Yeah. Uh, the other one is the unintentional. For example, the data may come from different device. The, the data may come from different um, different cohort. So in that case, uh, what kind of uh, features in the data set is not covered in the original training site? Yeah. So in that case, uh, then we are able to design different algorithms to cover those. Uh, uncertainties. Yeah, so I just wanted to add on that to the point uh, to address the question as well. US FDA has also mandated actually every, each of the AI algorithms to be tested in the intended use environment. So to answer the audience question, the intended use environment is superly important, right? So today you will need to test your AI algorithms in a very uh, real world settings. So in the clinic today, if the next seven days the types of the representations of the patient's populations that come into my doorsteps. This is exactly how the AI, if you pitch it to um, be compared to a physician, this is a head-to-head -head comparison that you have to simulate in the testing environment. And when you report the diagnostic performance of your AI algorithms being an AUC sensitivity or specificity, and the 95% confidence interval is especially important. These are the environment that you have to submit to the regulatory approval for assessment. So I think these are some of the very important, you know, the clinical and the technical questions that I think the audience also have to, you know, understand. So I also asked you about the GAN. So would you like to share a little bit about the GAN, you know, the experiments and the, you know, the, uh, the stuff that you've been doing so far? Yeah, uh, GAN has been, uh introduced a few years back. Yeah. So initially people are very excited about that because it's able to generate some unseen images. Uh, so people also think, can we just uh, use this to, to generate images for those that rare disease such that we have more data to train the AI system. So will the AI system become better with these uh, generated images? Yeah. But it looks that doesn't really uh, give us a very much uh, uh, benefits. Uh, in terms of performance. The reason simply because the data we use to train again is still the original data set. 
Yeah. So there's no additional information uh, from that. So in that case, it's still, we didn't say too much improvement by doing that, uh, but, um, but it still gave us uh, another angle. For example, people uh, recently used their GAN to generate the, the different images. Then we use those images for contrast deep learning, as mm. I mentioned just now. Yeah. So basically we generate different image and tell the system actually they are from the same, uh, same kind of uh, object. So we can use contrastive learning to improve the representation of the, of the image. So in that case, it still help us to improve the performance in certain way. Right, right. I just want to not forget the, that we do have some international audiences. Yeah. Maybe we can uh, just adjust our lenses to be beyond Singapore. Yeah. That if we have to consider ASEAN, for example, how, how can we as a community work with them? I kind of want to leave the question a bit open. And how can we actually say that what is a working model if let's say we were to do and help AI or start AI in another country like Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, what is the experience and what would you think that is useful, how Singapore can poise ourselves in such a way that we can create the right AI algorithm and using the right data for the intended purpose of the intended country. Dean, your thoughts maybe? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's an extraordinarily exciting time to be in this region, many other regions as well. I, I, I think one thing I mentioned earlier was looking at things like bias, right? Uh, data bias to make sure that uh, the, the data that's being used to train the different models is sufficiently representative so that the, uh, so that the, the outputs will be accurate and it will, be, it will help as many patients as possible. I would say that much like many other fields, so with, especially in my area, which is mostly intervention, right? AI is being leveraged to design therapies, to design combos. And, yeah. and I think something that we would, we should minimize or prevent uh, the AI field from experiencing is kind of defaulting what's discovered to traditional ways of, of clinical validation. And what I mean by that is you know, oftentimes we'll, we'll, we'll use AI to optimize drug doses and drug selection. And then the next question is, okay, so you, you put that into a traditionally designed RCT, uh, uh, randomized control trial uh, for, the, for everybody out there to, to determine whether these drugs are effective. The, the issue here is the whole basis for how AI, digital, other optimization approaches were leveraged was the ability to explore different permutations of drugs and doses. I'll give you an example then. If you take some of this and you put it into a clinical trial, uh, you have a patient who comes in and gets randomized to a low dose, a middle dose, or a high dose. And if that patient does not respond to the high dose of treatments, they are removed from the trial, right? They're a non-responder, they're removed. We will never have known if they could have responded to a lower dose. Right? And then the next question people will say is, well, if you didn't respond there, how could you respond there? But the thing is, the whole point of what we're leveraging has shown that already, right? That a person who is totally non-responsive up here, traditional medicine would move them off this treatment. But in fact, we drop the dose and then their biomarkers go down and they're a responder, as it turns out. So we've leveraged all of this AI, this amazing technology to make this discovery only to subject it to a traditional way of validation such that we lose Right, the initiative on that. Yeah. And so, so we, what, what's exciting about this region, to get back to this question, is I think there's a level of agility um, and adaptivity here to, we have, you know, data that's available, innovation in algorithms, as well as the outputs of that, which are different drug combos, better ways of imaging, et cetera. Yeah. But we have to keep that story going. Mm -hmm. And I think having interacted with the regulators in this space already and having had these discussions about proving the actual effectiveness of the AI platforms, of the drugs, of the imaging approaches, we have to finish that story. Yeah. And then innovate trial design, mm -hmm. right? And I think this is one of the few regions in the world with the ability to innovate how we design trials, to, to learn more from each subject that's enrolled, to truly determine effectiveness, right? I think that's, that's, that's an exciting thing for us to explore here. There's always been a very common story that, you know, countries may buy expensive equipment, 
or the capability of interpreting the results can be limited. And, and I think that's something and potentially where AI can come play a role. Maybe Ben want to comment on any of this area? I, I, will, I will comment on the digital angle. I, I think, I think um, uh, as, with, as with the centers that you have, right? Uh, the, the innovation center, um, extrapolating that, expounding on that, I think Singapore is in a very good position to be the AI center yeah. for the region, right? Because we have the infrastructure, uh, we have the relevant regulatory bodies, yeah. talents, um, and, and so on and so forth. So, so, so I think we should lend ourselves and aid ourselves and assist the region and, and to, to further explore AI. It may, even going to an extent that we can have a, a, a kind of a infrastructure, a data center, uh, running the algorithms, you know, uh, the other regions, EMR system can send uh, whatever necessary to, 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 the, to this center, we interpret it, we run it, we send back a message and tell them this is, this is the case. Yeah? And then where, where they need to validate uh, uh, algorithms and, and so on and so forth, send us your data. We have the processing power, we have supercomputers, uh, we, you know, yeah. and, and we grow as, as a region. Uh, very important. Do you have anything to add uh, on what Henry has just asked? Yeah, I mean, one technical approach could be the federated learning on the center. Given the data is yeah. located in, in overseas, other countries, but mm. they still can get involved in the whole process, such that they can participate in our some kind of consulting. Yeah. Then we can use our AI to maybe help them. We can actually build our model together. Yeah. So while, still preserving, uh, yes. while still preserving the data privacy. Yes. Right? yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that's very important. So I'm actually conscious of time. I've been uh, told that uh, we are, the time is running up. The talk, as I said, was super exciting. Uh, it's my great privilege to have all these big boys in the field to come join us today. And um, with, um, uh, I would like to uh, once again express my uh, you know, thankfulness to SG Innovate for co-hosting this with us, uh, with Anywhere, Sing Health, and Duke Anywhere. And hopefully we can uh, see you guys more and keep the questions coming. Do reach out. You have all our link. Uh, we are all on LinkedIn email address and please uh, and then uh, we will actually also share the presentation after the event as well thank you once again for spending your saturday morning for us we hope to see you again thank you